Um, is there any kind of compressed training or study method that helps me to push my sense of design more? I like to be able to come up with a more crazy design, but anything that you can recommend. So one of the things that uh, I, I'll answer that one first before I get started um, is, and I showed this in a, a previous class too, so if you wanna watch kind of what I talked about there is towards the end of the critique. Um, I'll just draw a shape within a shape. <clears throat> And the goal here is that, can I make interesting design from just can I make interesting design just from simple shapes. You know, can I make like a, some sort of composition? And then can I keep at it? Like, can I add more values? You know, and just constantly create these patterns. You know, and it's not like I'm trying to create some sort of environment or whatever. I'm just focused on shapes right, abstract shapes, and to try to design them well. Uh, I can do the same thing with shape extension. So come up with like a kind of a basic shape and then see if I can add more to it without it getting worse. Yeah, that's that's not a good choice. This is better. All right, just keep taking out from the silhouette before it becomes complete and utter nonsense. Right? Again, with no purpose other than to just get better at design. Is that helpful, Yasha? I used to fill sketchbooks full of these types of things. If you're talking, I can't hear you. Uh, I can hear you now. Just abstract shapes might begin to. Yeah, so think of it like this. You know, when you're, when you're trying to get better at painting forms, you know, a really good suggestion that I usually make, and I'm sure you've heard other people make, is to just like paint cubes and spheres and cylinders and cones, you know, like simple stuff, like simple forms. And that makes sense intuitively, right? Like you're like, oh yeah, I get that, right? Because if you can't paint a cube, what chance do you have to painting like the human figure, right? Which right. is much more complicated. And so the same idea is here, right? Like what chance do you have to make ex interesting and ex you know, extravagant designs if you can't even make abstract shapes look good. You know, like if you can't make a bunch of triangles look good together. You know? <clears throat> and it's the same with like adding, because like, you know, if you think about what I just did with the, for instance, the shape extension stuff, right? Like I just was like, drew a shape and then I just try to find ways to, to add to the shape, right? Yeah, you see what I did there? Mm. And then remember I was talking about the patterns. Again, I wasn't trying to make like some sort of environment. It looked like an environment, but this is because I closed it into a composition. But it's the same idea, like, 
you know? Like, how do I make a bunch of a little bit more complicated abstract shapes look well together? But now it's in the context of like, this is actually a design of like some sort of form. Yeah. Like it could be like a robot's shoulder. See that? But if you think about it as abstract as I was doing before, it wasn't, it didn't have any purpose, but now I put some cut lines in this and maybe render it. It's like a robotic shoulder pad. It's some good de design to it, you know? And that's like focus on aesthetic design. Now to, to kind of think about it, you know, outside of aesthetic, like how to push narratively, um, a really good way to do that. I'm going to do that right now with this, this, this design, this fantasy character design I'm about to paint is to, um, to think about it as like a real thing, like a real character with real stuff going on. So, for instance, this character, let's say, is death. And death Um, is looking for souls, okay? You know, standard stuff, right? And so normally, if I'm designing a character like death, you know, I think about all the things that would make it fascinating. Okay, so right now I'm not doing any of that. I'm just designing um, kind of the torso, focus mostly on the painting. And so, and, and by the way, I should start talking about this process a bit more. So whenever I'm designing a process, or when I'm approaching a certain process, I think about the objective. So the objective in this instance is like, this is, has to be kind of terrifying. Maybe that's the client what they wanted. So I'm starting in a setting where I have to focus on lighting as the main design drive. And the, and the logic here is that the client is looking for me to design something terrifying. And so that's what I do. And so I will, I usually sketch out really rough some of the, the core ideas of the design, like the frailty of the skin and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to have like, okay, so now let's, now let's push some of the cool, um, design elements that's going to make this more fascinating okay so we've normally see the grim reaper thing with the scythe and like the hood and all that good stuff but i'm, I'm going to avoid that because uh and i wouldn't necessarily avoid it entirely i probably would do a version of it but since i'm only going to do one little demonstration here uh, actually i want to do a couple i want to demonstrate a different process but for this one, I'm not going to. I'm going to just focus on this one process. So, um, and then this will also answer the kind of more more elaborately the other part of the design question for you, Yasha. Okay. So at the same time, hopefully, I can answer both questions. So, since I know that this is supposed to be a little bit more, you know, like terrifying or has some sort of 
fear element to it, uh, I'm going to go ahead and start begin, beginning to design that. And one of the things that I'll do is to just think of something that's not standard. So I'll say, okay, what if, what if his head is not necessarily attached conventionally? Like what if it's attached by what appears to be like a bunch of fingers? And that's such a frightening idea because people get weirded out by like lots of fingers and knuckles. And because it's so weird, I'm going to continue doing it. I'm going to continue doing it as we go down. And the the narrative could be, well, you know, maybe the death is like actually harboring these souls and some of them are still trying to get out. And they're like trying to actually like climb their way out of it, but there's, they have no chance. And these are like the freshly right souls that he's taken and then and then what i do here is just keep pushing that narrative as best i can so whenever you're designing and you have one theme right you do everything in your power within within your visual power to spin that narrative so that any facet of this design if it's seen by somebody for the first time they'll have some clue of like what's going on here. And even if they don't, they should still kind of have this aura. So combining unusual slash different ideas to give a fresh take on standard theme. Yeah, that's only if you're allowed to. Sometimes you'll get a client and they'll just say, like, just draw the Grim Reaper, you know, exactly as people know him to be. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if they're like, we're trying to reinvent, then I'll be all right, let's do this. Let's figure this out. And I'll do several designs. I wouldn't just do one. I'll do many. Uh, remember, I'm teaching guys iterations, right? And so I do iterations a ton. So this is creepy frog that has like these super weird spory like back. I'm sure you've seen it. I can't really look at it because it's I have like some sort of uh, phobia for it, but I can definitely draw it. It doesn't affect me as much if I'm actually the creator of it. But what if there is a lot of that on this guy too? And these are where the souls who've exhausted that he's exhausted they just get evaporated and then too into thin air. So maybe his his cowl, if you will, like the hoodie is just a trail of smoke and the smoke is actually dead souls now here's the thing i will probably will never have to explain any of this okay like i don't think you should you shouldn't have to be like okay like let me explain to you why all these holes are. like just have people's imagination fill in the blanks that's why i love movies that try to avoid uh, tremendous amounts of exposition because when you try to explain everything to people uh i feel like you're you're wasting your time you, you need to ex explain things in a way to people that that you don't have to explain things to people like they should have some sort of understanding just from whatever it is you're presenting them Yeah. Some people have a real phobia for it. I do. If you guys could look at it without any weird feeling, like I get real itchy and like, I don't know, it's weird. My daughter gets the same way. My wife doesn't. She's just, she's like, what?
Right. And so my process on doing stuff like this, it generally goes like this. Depending on what the task is, I'll just straight up just paint. Right. Now, if the task is to just come up with several drawings and iterations, then I'll, I'll still paint, but I'll, I'll be a little bit more, like right now I'm being really, um, you know, um, you know, cautious. I'm trying to make every stroke count type of thing. But if I was to really not care, I would just go ahead and just keep, like paint like crazy fast. And I'm going to demonstrate that in just a second. But one thing is remains true. I always try to have a clear drawing, even if it's not clean. So something that an artist named Glenn Keane actually said. He said, uh, you know, <clears throat> it's better to be clear than it is to be clean. And what he means by that is like, it's better to have a clear design, an idea, versus just really nice painting with a terrible idea. <coughs> and yeah, let's just give them more fingers. <coughs> Jesus, man, this cough's not going away. Any other questions as I do this? And I'm gonna talk about more about process in the next demo and do one more demo. Feel free to unmute, prefer chatter. Difference between blue sky and production phases and game development? Yeah, sure. <sighs> Refreshing. So blue sky is essentially just where you have like a, a, a sliver of an idea. You know, nothing too, nothing too crazy, just a sliver. And you just have the team do everything in their power to try to make it work, you know? And, and in a, a regular game, like if you don't have Blue Sky, just regular production, you don't have that. You just have a really set schedule and you just try to do everything in your power to make the game come to fruition with the resources that you have access to. Um, so blue sky is just like, like exactly what I'm saying. Like imagine like you have a team and you have a lot of money, you have a team of people and they're just like, all right, we want you guys to just make a game. You guys made a game before, you guys made Shark Busters 2, but you know, make your own IP now, like make another IP or whatever, uh, and we'll be confident that it'll be fine. And so then you get that extra cash, you make that extra IP, you know, and, uh, and it's blue sky, like nobody has any idea what the game is yet. So you just draw a crap load of drawings and just get inspired, test technologies, etc. And then regular production is like, get back to Shark Busters 4. You know, you're going to make that game. You understand? And so then there's already a lot of already pre-established concepts to work from. <clears throat> and I prefer, I prefer production. Just regular. We already know what the plan is. Let's get started. 
Ugh, excuse me. Now, I think that there's something powerful about, um, you know, there's something really powerful about like a, just a uh, opportunity to come up with whatever you want. But I think that that's actually harder to kind of wrangle because, because it's so open-ended because people have so many options, right? And because people have so many options, they don't tend to settle on anything. It's just too much of a, my least favorite thing, analysis paralysis. So having some limitations or having some concrete roadmap is incredibly more empowering in my opinion. And I think there's more opportunity for creativity. Now, obviously, if you keep working on the same project after like, you know, the seventh iteration of it, you know, very unlikely that it's going to keep people enticed if they've worked on it for like seven years. Um, but, you know, some people really do enjoy making the same kind of game over and over again. Like Rockstar is a great example of this. And they, they make some of the best open world games ever made. Uh, right now, uh, C- CD Projects making an open world game again, like, like Witcher, but just with the cyberpunk theme. And I think that game's going to be incredibly successful. I'm pretty positive it is. Because they've already kind of created that type of game before. They're just now doing it in a different theme and different skin. And that will bring different challenges that will be rewarding and fun, but they're not changing genres. I think that's incredibly smart. So Blue Sky, in my opinion, is unless, the, unless they already know kind of the game that they want to make and then they just don't know the kind of look that it's going to have, then yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, production. Just regular old production. So let's talk about processes. So uh, I showed you guys like where I do like the thumbnail and then I just pull from it. But what I've done is I've gotten really good at just painting shapes. And one of the reasons why I got good at this is because it's the fastest, at least for now that I can see. And so if I'm designing now a fantasy character, let's, um, let's do some medieval armor. Right, we'll draw the character's heads right here. And so one thing that I've learned is that if you spend too much time with all of the, like the features of like the face and stuff, you'll 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 waste more time than you'll um actually need. And so that's why I usually just try to get in like some basic tones that I'll correct later. And then I'll start to just do the more important stuff. And this is typically how I go about designing. I don't necessarily just do a thumbnail. I usually will do a completed sketch of some sort. But I do still like do broad strokes. Let's give this character just, I don't want to give him a lot of armor. Just give him that one piece of armor. And then he's got like the breastplate and that's pretty much it. And then he's got this cool collar that resides on the breastplate. And then, uh, now I will say something about the blue sky stuff. Uh, one, one more thing is that I, I like to do it for myself <laughs> because I am a little more uh, conservative. I'll just pick something and then I'll just go with it. I'm a little bit easier. Like I, I'm, I'm a little bit less picky. Like I can just, I, I can make a choice and decision pretty rapidly and then just stick with it. All right, so that's good. I don't think I need to be do more than the best. And so you can see here, 
that I did like kind of just a rough sketch, you know, nothing too fancy. And then uh, I have a couple more minutes under my timeline to kind of now put in some of the, the features that I think this design needs. which would be like the local values, maybe correcting some of the proportions too. And you can see that my process has evolved so quick, uh, so efficiently, right? Like I focus less and less on like detail and minutia. I focus on big ideas and I try to get them in rapidly. And once I get them in, you can see you save a lot of time. And this is just extremely challenging. Now I've used to do a lot of stuff before. I used to do line art, but then I gave up on that actually pretty rapidly. Then I used to do, um, uh, I used to do, uh, what was it? Uh, like a, more of like a block and silhouette stuff, the kind of the stuff that I had you guys do. Uh, in fact, I did that the most, but then I found, you know, silhouettes are in themselves not as effective as just straight up sketches. So then I started practicing sketching to the point where I'm at today. And I think it is the fastest way like to, to block in basically, block in your paintings. Like paint like a painter. Like if you watch a painter paint, they paint just like this, right? They block in, uh, not just like this. I go much, much more uh, at a rapid pace, but that's the thing. I'll just go, I'm just going faster. But that's the point. I've been training to go faster. You know? And so that was about five minutes in. So you can see within five minutes, I was able to get all the information that I need. Now, or at least most of the information. Now with line art and all that stuff, you know, in five minutes, you, you might still only be roughing out the, the forms and the anatomy, right? Am I correct? Like you're just getting kind of the, just a general gist of the proportions, uh, maybe even less than that. And then you spend another five to 10 minutes trying to figure out more refinement of those things. Then another five to 10 minutes getting the design roughed in and all this stuff and another five to 10 minutes and more of that and then so on and so forth until the point is that like about an hour you finally have some a reasonable thumbnailed sketch which is probably not even close to what I've done right now, right? This is usually what most of you guys have experienced. Now think about it. All the stuff that happened before all the things that I explained before, like being able to get the proportions right, the, uh, the forms, all that stuff, those are the hurdles that are preventing you from drawing rapidly. And so whenever I tell people you should study fundamental stuff like pa painting well, painting effectively, understanding anatomy, proportions, perspective, design, like knowing a lot of this stuff at a very subconscious and at a very core level, will allow you to paint faster because then you're not thinking about them. You're just doing what you want to do, which is draw the design that you have in your mind. You're not worried about your actual inability to draw anymore because you're pretty capable. You're actually thinking about what it is that you're drawing and how you're going to draw it. Okay. And so a lot of times um, you want to perfect this process and this is what you got to do. So this is five minutes in. So let's do another five minutes and see if we can get even more time ahead. Now, I've, I've found that a bit within five minutes, I can decide whether my design's worth exploring further. In this case, it is. So I'm gonna go ahead and go a little bit further. Until about five minutes in, I can decide this. And if I'm not talking, I go even faster. I get even more information then. But since I'm talking, I have to pay a little less attention. 
Does anyone have any other questions? And feel free to use your mics. Feel alone. You guys don't talk to me. So, so when I do uh, the studies for the homework, um, uh -huh. can I go by, like, you have the how to study video on YouTube, which is great. Do you have any updates to that video since it's a few years old? It's, it's still the same. <laughs> it's, it's just a little bit more articulate, that's all. I say the same stuff, I just am more articulate about it. Right. Um, I put more emphasis these days on um, the testing. Like I, I teach people that you know a test is neither supposed to be easy or hard, right? A, a test is just this gauge where your skill is at that's it meaning that like when people i, I would have people say you know I, I would assess and then i would apply and it would just be really hard you know like it's like i don't i don't I didn't learn anything and i said that's probably true so what are you going to do about it and um and then they're just like oh i see and then because they they didn't realize that tests aren't supposed to be easy like when I say you test yourself, I didn't say test yourself and then you'll know that you're dope now. I said test yourself so you can test yourself. Testing yourself in itself, in essence, is to find out where you're at. Make sense? So for instance, if you studied for about an hour and then you test what you think you've learned and it turns out terribly, like you can't remember anything that you've learned, right? Which happens. What do you think that means then? You studied in the wrong way. Uh, absolutely. That, or you just weren't paying attention. Maybe you studied right, but you just weren't effectively attended with your mind. Um, if, I were to like, if I were to use this example for anything else, like for, like, let's say, a math test, right? And let's say we're going to test your skills at uh, linear algebra, okay? And you get a D on your test. What does that mean about your knowledge of linear algebra? It's not sufficient yet. Yeah, that's, that's all it is. It doesn't mean that you're stupid. It doesn't mean that you personally are inept. It just means you're unskilled and unknowledgeable, right? That's it. That's all it means. And once you understand that very simple principle, uh, you'll find that learning almost anything is within reach. Anything, anything that you thought was so incredibly challenging, you know, because you'll realize, uh, well, that's why I have to test myself, you know, see the problem with like a lot of Western educational systems and, and especially Eastern ones too now, right? Like, um, like the modern education systems these days that focus a lot on status. The problem with them is that they make you take a test to assess where you're at. And then if you fail the test, they're like, well, I guess you suck which is not inaccurate, but that's the wrong attitude, right? And, and what they'll do is like, you'll fail these tests and then people will do everything in their power just to try to pass these tests so they can go to the next grade, right? And what you end up doing is you end up with a handful of people that actually don't have critical thinking skills and ability to learn on their own, okay? You have a bunch of people that are just faking till they make it, like literally, right? And that is, that is not a good system to uh, foster smart individuals. What you want to do instead is you make people take tests and then you see where they're at. And instead of saying you got an F or you failed, you say, well, you're, you're, not, you're not skilled enough at this thing. So instead of moving on, we're gonna keep you on this assignment, right? And you're gonna focus in on this until you can understand it, right? Okay, so that was for another five minutes. So let's make another one. So until you understand it, meaning like, so everyone else in the class is gonna move ahead who deserves to go ahead. The rest of the class who doesn't are just gonna stay behind, but not to make them feel bad. We're just going, that's just necessary. They need to um be in you know be able to to move along 
And then, and then as they graduate from their classes, you let them go to the next grade, but you don't look at it as grades. You just look at it at the next level. So those who, you know, excelled at that math quiz, whatever tests, then obviously they take more accelerated classes, right? Uh, and then the other students just take the classes that are next. So even if I'm in 11th grade and you're in 11th grade and you're in like, you know, grade 10 algebra, even though you're 11th grade, I can, I can be, let's say, in grade 12 algebra. You know, but we're both in the same class and we have a different structure in the class where you have multiple teachers who can help out uh, each individual student. Right. And um, the reason why uh, people don't do this is because governments, at least American government, doesn't give a lot of money to education. Right. So then you end up th with the opposite result. You have a lot of people taking a class and for those who aren't capable or just left behind and their, their, uh, their lack of education is compounded every grade they go into. And that's why we have a high illiteracy in America because we just literally just leave kids behind. We don't give uh, a crap. You know, Obama said no child left behind, but he still was stupid. He, he put in terrible policies that didn't help. The best is to kind of like simulate what I've done here in my class. As you guys could probably know, this is much better, right? Like there's some students who are much better and more accelerated. So they are moving along much faster. And the rest of you that I don't feel as accelerated i don't push you i just put you where you're at at your pace because you're going to get better that way you're not going to get better if i tell you <coughs> if i all tell i told everybody you all have to get seven or six thumbnails or uh, iterations done by the end of this week right <coughs> some of you guys were still finishing thumbnails because what will end up happening is that you'll become overwhelmed and you'll end up stop doing the homework or you'll do it, but it's just won't, it'll just be really bad. And then you'll have a false sense of, of quality of your own work. It's not helpful. And so whenever you're studying, you have to think the same way. You have to think, I need to stop being in such a hurry. If I'm like drawing at a fourth grade level, then I just have to accept that. And I have to start there. Not try to start at like a 12th grade level. I'm not saying that any of you guys draw or uh, are at that level, I'm just making a point. Hopefully you guys understand. Like you have to know where you're at. Like you may see one of your peers like way better and like you're oh man, I need to get to that level. You will in time, right? And eventually you'll be potentially even better than them. Uh, that's happened with me. I was, when I first started school, I was the worst amongst my peers. And then when I ended, or at least when I left school, I was one of the f first most successful artists out of the school, right? And so, and that had nothing to do with my natural ability. That had everything to do with my incredible persistence. And so, and, and the best way that I think learning anything is to know where you're at, and to stay focused on per subject. Like if you're looking to get better at anatomy, then just stay on anatomy for at least a week, at least a week, so you can understand it at some better level than you did prior. If you jump ahead, like you only study anatomy for like a day, and then you go and try to study some forms the next day, uh, and then the next day you try to do lighting or whatever, um, there's too many things to try to learn in such a short amount of time. You need more time to let things sink in. Was that helpful? Cool. <laughs> So right now, this is 15 minutes in. And to me, this is getting pretty close. I normally spend about uh, 30 minutes total on a thumbnail at the max. 
And as you can tell, 15 minutes in, uh, that means I'm only halfway done with the thumbnail. And, uh, you know, granted, I'm only doing a bus too, so it's not as challenging. But let's look at this. Look at my, uh, the first five minutes. See what I mean? Like a lot of what I needed is already in there and everything else is just added bonus. Pretty much most of what I wanted was there. And I left the opportunity for things to get more challenging or more detailed. I think I ended up going a little more sci-fi than I think I wanted to. So I'm going to change that. Let's go ahead and fix that in the next five minutes. I think, Isaac, you're the one that was asking about it. Right? We needed more of like some sort of embroidered look. And I know a few things are true, meaning that if I'm lazy with like kind of the detail now, I'm going to pay for it later. So it's usually pretty good to try to do a decent job with the, the detail. Yeah, this, this kind of striping, it's kind of very sci-fi. So let's go ahead and get rid of that. Hey, AJ, just curiosity. Um, would you advise uh, students to use always use a grid when drawing characters? A grid? Uh, I've, I've never really done it. I think using a grid would be smart, though, because there's a more opportunity to see the proportion. Um, but I, I've always adopted the tactic of just try not to have any kind of uh, crutch. You know? Yeah. Like, really try to be able to design without anything. Um, like, without, like, so many parameters. You know? So, for instance, I, I switched over to Procreate, and I'm pretty effective in that tool. And, uh, you know, a lot of my peers were asking me about it. They're just like, whoa, how the hell did you... You drew that on an iPad? You know? And And some of them I was kind of like... Like, yeah, you should already know why this is possible. <laughs> you know, like, I don't know why you're shocked. And uh, and the reason why I would say that is because, like, it's not about the tools type of thing, you know? Like, the tools absolutely need to have some level of uh, ability to, to do certain types of things, right? Like, it's... It's actually absolutely challenging to try to do a digital painting using only paper and pencil or just paint at all versus using acrylics or oils, you know? It's definitely more challenging, but it's not impossible. There's great people who can do these amazing pencil drawings that look like paintings, right? You know what I'm talking about. I'm sure you've seen them. Yeah. But, um, but like... Uh, the the iPad is like is not a, an exception. It's not like some sort of weird, mysterious tool. Like it's gotten to the point where it is just as comparable to a, a, a functional laptop or a PC. You know. So I was like, I'm more shocked that people are shocked that I'm capable of doing that, right? And um, because it's just it's completely the same tool. It's just smaller <laughs> and different software, right? And uh, I was on the plane. I was doing a, a, a painting, and my um, my buddy who was flying with me was just like, "Whoa! Like, how did you like learn how to do that on the Procreate?" And I was like, "Just like I said to you, I was like, uh, I just practice, man. <laughs> I've been." painting on this thing for nearly uh, uh, three or four months now. And I've just gotten used to it. And then I was like, also I looked into all the hot keys and shortcuts just like I would with Photoshop. And there's a lot. There's a lot of good ones. And he was just like, whoa, I didn't know you could do that. I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't know you could do that. And I was showing him all the hot keys and stuff. And he's like, how did you find all this stuff out? And I'm like, I just read the manual. And he's like, what? <laughs> I mean, yeah, it comes with the manual, dude. And he's like, oh my gosh. 
Like he felt kind of silly, right? But that's my point. Like that's kind of how it is, man. A lot of people just don't read between the lines. They just want things to just work right away. And that group of people that think that way are generally those who cannot push boundaries. Okay? Because they live within the box. And and to be honest, the reading the the instructions is not like living outside of the box. That's kind of just basic stuff. Just people forgot that you can do that. When I was a kid and I would get a new video game, dude, I would read the shit out of those manuals. I'm sure most of you guys did too. Like on the way home, you know, I remember nostalgically, like I would just read, uh, I would read like everything because I was so excited. Like I hate reading in general. Like I don't, I, I try to get like a storybook and I try to read it and I just don't like it. But then when it comes to like instructional stuff, like how to do stuff, like I can read that stuff all day. I'm really more into like the knowledge of how things work versus just some narrative. My, my favorite way to ingest, ingest narrative is either through comic books or movies or TV shows, like moving pictures or graphic pictures with words, like picture books. That is my favorite way of in, engaging in story. And I'm not alone. That's very popular. You know, books don't make billions of dollars as much as like movies do. Movies are sometimes based off of books, right? Because they know people don't read. I'm going to go watch a movie right now that's based off of a, a, a book. Oh, wait, this is 10 minutes in. I should have made another layer. Okay, let's do another five minutes. So this will be 25 after this. Um, <laughs> I don't know which version was the older version, but from what I've heard, I think, I think so. The version that I have, I think is the latest version and that's the version that I learned, but that's kind of the point. Like I'm saying is that since the Apple pen came, it just, it made the, it made the, it made procreate like completely viable. What the hell is that music? Who's listening to music? I mean, it's fine. Just turn it off for us. <laughs> you guys, you guys heard it, right? It's like it's funny. Any other questions, Isaac? Did you have any more questions about a uh, workflow and process? I actually, I actually have a question if Isaac doesn't have any more. Well, is he still? He's still oh, here. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking right now. <laughs> but do you understand kind of what I was trying to say about just like, you got to just practice the different things, you know, because uh, my process, especially the one that you're watching me do right now, um, and even when I was explaining it, I'm sure still there's a lot of like, like, oh man, this is like, that's a lot of work. And, and that's kind of the point I want to make. I always try to make. Um, when you're going from thumbnail to sketch, right? Like I think that the value of just practicing it a lot is the, the ultimate solution. It really is. But anyways, go ahead, Peter. You can ask your question. So when you're doing a lineup of characters, um, and I try to work with a grid, would you say like having the same horizon line on all of them, so the same perspective on all of them is advisable? Or can you do like a lineup and have them in completely different perspectives? You know, I, I think I think uh, anything that you could do to, to have those designs be readable, be readable is all you want to focus on. Um, I don't really have a straight answer for you, to be honest, because I don't actually use grids. So I'm not gonna just kind of tell you something. Um, but if you're using the grid for perspective, then then absolutely they should all kind of 
live on the same horizon line because it's just how perspective works. But at the same time, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Like, only thing that I can think that the grid does effectively is the idea of basically um, pushing your ability to see your shapes and proportions uh, almost immediately. Right? It helps me see mistakes. That's basically it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it helps you spot them much easier. So that that's like the most obvious thing that i know about grids right or to transfer it, uh, an image to another image and that's mostly useful for big scaled paintings okay so for instance like if i were to try to like say you know what i'm gonna paint this painting now that i did here on oil or in oils you know um I could, I could do that, but it would be easier if I like made a grid on top of this character. You understand? And then it's like putting together like a puzzle piece or a puzzle. <coughs> you know? That's how um, some traditional painters do large scale paintings from their sketches. Like Leindecker used to do that a lot. <laughs> This is just a good, it's a draftsman, uh, draftsman trick. But other than that, yeah, I don't use grids. So I don't have any strong insight on that. You're on your own on that one. You need to find someone else who's a little more educated on that to give you better answers. All right, thanks. Yeah. So yeah, this is about five minutes in. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 25 minutes in now. So we got five minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Yep. And so this is Honestly, like right where I'll stop, I wouldn't go any further than this. This is usually what I would submit to my client. He'd be like, well, what do you think, boss? You know, and I would usually have a variety of characters at this level, you know? I'd usually have like five or six if I can. Uh, I usually will go no lower than four designs, okay? Um, no, I'm sorry, no lower than three designs. So I will, I'll show them usually three uh, of something. And sometimes I'll just do two and then I'll just do like variations of those, like iterations. So there's always still like a variety of stuff to look at. And then I just wait for feedback and then they'll tell me like, oh, you know, we want the hair to be this way or the, the can you make it darker or can you make it lighter? These types of things. Or can you make the shoulder pads more epic or less epic? And then I just try to make those changes, you know? excuse me but now let's say my boss wants me to refine these or he likes it he or she and then i'll just go ahead and refine it and i'll just going to demonstrate that right now for you and getting back to the workflow idea like this is why it's imperative incredibly imperative that you understand your process because when you understand your process then you can go in there and start to refine it rapidly and that's like the the greatest tool of just perfecting your process is that you can kind of do consistently well with it. And the key word here is consistent. Because a lot of times people don't have a strong hold on their process and they also don't have a strong hold on like 
basic anatomy and forms and what have you, right? But uh, once you start to practice and perfect these types of things, then all this stuff becomes much easier to do. Any other questions? It's like those hipster old man bearded models what I've done here. I like that haircut. If I could have hair, I would make my hair look like this. Maybe in the future, they'll invent some sort of natural hair growth. I could have hair again. That would be nice. It'll be weird. I haven't had a haircut and like, I don't know what it's like. I remember I went and got my beard trimmed because my wife wanted to do that for me. So she, she paid for it. And uh, it was weird. Cause I was like, I sat in the barber's chair and everything. And I was like, the, like when's the last time I've actually done this? <laughs> it was like 10 years ago. And like shampooing my hair and conditioning it. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have to, I would have to do all that stuff again. <coughs> Actually, I should make this a little bit darker. Just so I can make the light part come out even more. But because like every part of my process, I'm in a lot of control. <coughs> even if I had to make a dramatic change to this image, like if my boss says, you know what, we decided that we don't want him to have, you know, hair at all. I could I could make those changes really easily. I mean, it still take me time. It wouldn't be like I get it done in like half a second or anything like that. But it just I wouldn't be f stressing out. You know, I've done a lot of paint overs too of other people's paintings over the years, so I have abilities to like paint over something that is considered finished. Any other questions? I guess everyone knows everything they used to know. <laughs> It's all right. We have like a lot more extra time. So right at 11, I think I'll just stop the class. I think we'll be good to go. Send you guys off into the world. But hopefully this demo is helpful for you guys to see kind of how I would go about doing stuff. And really at this point, to be honest, it's, it's really just about refinement. It's just like, okay, just refine and refine and refine. And honestly, I actually prefer my iPad for refinement these days. I feel the brushes feel better for cleaning up and you can rotate better. So there's just a lot of advantages that I prefer that I just don't get from uh, Photoshop.
like the brushes are really smooth in Procreate. Also, I can get my brushes really small and it feels small. Like with Photoshop, there's still kind of a limit to how small you can get. I mean, it's the same, you can get this just as small, like to about a pixel, but it just feels smaller on Procreate. And I think they do something with it. I think they actually like effectively turn it into like a, uh, like a pencil brush, like a, p a pixel brush. And because it's more, because it's a pixel brush, it has more uh, grit. Where Photoshop's still trying to like put some uh, like anti-aliasing on it, even if it's tiny. I find that the smudge tool in Procreate is absolutely epic. Yeah, this has got a lot of, like I said, like tools that I feel are better for refinement. You know? <coughs> like I can finish things in Photoshop. But like as, as I'm painting this now, I just feel like oh, this will be easier in Procreate. Like I've gotten spoiled. And that's what I would do, seriously. I'll just like take a painting pretty quick, far, and then I'll just send it over to Procreate and finish it there. I was talking to a, to a fellow student who's much younger and doesn't have a big budget. And he was like, should I go for a Cintiq or a, a laptop and, a, and an Intuos? And I'm like, I'm pretty sure if you just want to paint and not do 3D that the iPad is the best deal out there right now. Yep, that's good advice. I agree. And so you can see like when you have like those five minute increments, it really keeps you focused. It keeps, at least it keeps me really focused. Maybe five minutes is too short for you. It's 10 minutes or even 15 minutes might be good kind of reminder to just step up your game or to make more progress. But you'll see, like once this five minutes is up, I'm gonna go back and we'll look at the original drawing. And you'll see kind of the point I'm making about like just being clear from the beginning what your, what your ambitions were. Yeah, maybe I'll make the head a little bit brighter. But anyway. Um, yeah, because a lot of people focus way too much on like detail and then and then they have this drawing that's not very interesting and they just can't figure out what they did wrong. And it's usually what I said just suggested, they usually got started on the detail way too soon. Now when I first started painting, like it used to be like it used to take me about 15, 20 minutes to get like a, a reasonable uh, like drawing, like a 15, 20 minutes to like be like, okay, I think I got a pretty good drawing. And then from here, I think I can take this a little bit further, like 15 and 20 minutes. But then as time went on, you know, those 15, 20 minutes turns into like five to 10 minutes. Now I can get a reasonable drawing going around that time. It needs to take me about an hour or two hours to finish a complete, like, or finish a sketch. A sketch, kind of like what you're seeing here. It, took me, it used to take me an hour and so, but now it takes me um, half of that. And I think that's really important to understand. All right. We'll just stop here. 
so this is about 30 minutes, right? Or 35 minutes, maybe? Um, I forget. So it's five minutes in to about 30 to 35 minutes in. So you can see that pretty much a lot of what I had in the original sketch is pretty much there, you know? Obviously, it's a lot more detailed, but like if you watch kind of how we went into it, like I started off, like even like halfway through, I pretty much just decided what it was going to be. And then everything after that was just refinement. And so when I really tell you guys, you know, focus a lot of your attention in the beginning and try to make sure you get some good stuff going from there, uh, I really mean it. It really saves you tons of time in the, in the future. Uh, but it's, I get it. It's harder in the beginning for most of you because you still don't have a lot of foundational knowledge. So in, in between your work, do studies, practice, just keep practicing and then do some work and practice and do some work. And then the next thing you know, you'll be exceptional. So with that, peace out friends. Uh, unless you guys have one more question. Does anyone have one last question before we roll out? No? All right. Well, everybody have a great weekend. Can't wait to see you guys' stuff for next week. Appreciate y'all. Uh, I may or may not be traveling, but it won't matter. I'll still have my laptop and access to the internet, so the classes will still start at the same time. But if the audio sounds a little different, you'll know why. All right. And so with that, talk to you guys soon. See you guys next week. And work really hard and work really smart. Talk to you very, very soon. Bye. Thank you for watching this video. I appreciate it. Please subscribe to watch more in the future. If you like the video, I would appreciate a thumbs up. If you like this content, you can go to my website, robotpencil.net, where you can find mentorships, tutorials, and a Patreon to get more exclusive content. Thanks again, and I'll see you guys in my next videos.